Hi everyone, greetings to you, grace and peace to you and your families and we are so glad that you're able to join us right now um, wherever you may be for this Pogasa Center's online Bible study. So wherever you are, wherever you are around the world, um, whatever time it is, again we are so thankful that you can join us. Uh, I want to say hi to our um, dearest pastors and bishops, so Bishop Doc and Mama Shay, um, thank you. Um, for entrusting me to do this work of God and to my co-cell leaders, um, co-leaders, cell members, everyone, I just want to say hi and welcome. And we welcome you all. Um, if this is your first time to watch this, um, this is our online Bible study. Uh, you can catch us every week um, for the live versions, usually about 8 p 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on a Wednesday. And also, um, our evangelistic nights on Friday nights, um, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. So again, I'm so thankful that um, you are here to join us and I'm thankful to God for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. So um, I haven't introduced myself. My name is Sister um, Karen Ambad. Um, I'm one of the primary leaders of Pegasus Center, Pastor Shirley Ambad. Um, I thank God for her life and that of my senior um, bishop who has entrusted me to speak to you this evening. Um, I pray that our eyes are open, our ears are open, our hearts are open to receive what God has in store for us and I ask that his wisdom, his understanding um, to enlighten our minds um, so that we will have the humility and the courage to act as his word um, speak to us and that we are transformed into his likeness. So again, I um, am a student of the word of God and again, I can only do this by his grace. It is only through him that he shepherds and guides me. So um, before we start with our Bible study, I just want to um, commit this Bible study in prayer. Okay, so let's bow our heads and close our eyes. So heavenly Father, we see to thank you. You are good. You are great. You are magnificent. There is none like you. We humbly come before you asking you for the forgiveness of our sins. You said in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, O oh God. And for the sin that so easily entangles and the sins that we are unaware of, oh God, Lord, that has hurt you and grieved you, oh God, Lord, we ask that you reveal them to us so that we can come to you in repentance. We thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross, whose body was bruised and broken and whose blood was shed so that um, we can have this redeemed, restored and renewed life, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for the resurrection, oh God, the complete work of Jesus Christ so that we can have eternal life with you. We thank you for this evening that we can study your word and as we hear from you i ask that you grant us all wisdoms um, all understanding and guide us into all truths oh god give us the humility and open our eyes so that we can see all that you want us to study and that we will hear from you oh god lord we ask for breakthrough in every area of our life wherever it may be because we desire to have a complete and full life give us direction so that we can follow your words easily and that we will live reflect reflecting your glory alone oh god lord especially to this lost and dying world especially through our actions our words and our deeds we commit everything unto you in the mighty name of jesus i pray amen and amen so uh, if you were able to listen to the Bible study last week, uh, I spoke about the chapter 2 of 2 Peter. I will. I spoke about verses 1 to 19, and I spoke about the false teachers. And I gave us 22 clues about how you can identify these false teachers. So today, I will continue on with the rest of chapter 2 of 2 Peter, but I want us to be reminded about... Um, last week's lesson and I just want to again reread these 22 clues that identify the false teachers. So one, they will secretly bring on destructive heresies. They will even deny the Lord, which is number two. And third, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Number four, 
They walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness. Five, they despise authority. Six, they are presumptuous. Seven, they are self-willed. Eight, they speak evil of dignitaries. Nine, they speak evil of the things they do not understand. Ten, they are spots and blemishes. Eleven, they carouse in their own deceptions. Twelve, their eyes are full of adultery. Thirteen, their eyes never cease from sinning. Fourteen, they entice unstable souls. Fifteen, they have a heart trained in covetous practices. Sixteen, they are accursed children. Seventeen, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. 18 there are wells without water 19 there are clouds carried by a tempest 20 they speak great swelling words of emptiness 21 they allure those who have already escaped from the life of sin through the lust of the flesh and lastly clue 22 they promise liberty but are themselves slaves of corruption so the, this is the first truth that Peter wanted to lay out in his letters. The second truth, which we will be focus on, focusing on right now, found in verses 1 to 17, is the certain doom of these false prophets. So first truth was that how to identify them. And the second truth is how they are doomed as false prophets. And it is sure and it is certain. So as Peter teaches us how to recognize these false teachers and their false teachings, he punctuates these verses with specific statements concerning their certain doom of they themselves, these false prophets and teachers. So without a doubt, they are all on their way to destruction. And in verse 1, it says they will bring on themselves swift destruction. So the wages of sin is death, and we know this. Those who walk after the loss of the flesh are destined for destruction. So we who are attempting to walk in the spirit do not acknowledge the fact that with happiness or satisfaction. To the contrary, Paul shared with the Philippian believers in Philippians 3, 18 to 19, I tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction. It is only by God's grace we are not going to that end. Amen? So by his grace we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. That's found in Luke 9.23. So this destruction which they bring upon themselves will be swift. It will not tarry, but it will come rapidly. The second is found in verse 3. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber yeah again peter shares a direct statement about their impending judgment and imminent destruction yeah his language is vivid and precise yeah god is not idle he is not sleeping nor is he oblivious to the exploitation and the deceptiveness of these false prophets he knows many will follow their destructive ways and judgment and destruction are sure on their way. And from verses 4 to 11, the false teachers are doomed. Yeah, now Peter approaches this matter of the doom of the false prophets with specific biblical evidences. He, penet he asks penetrating questions as he presents these four specific examples. He mentions the angels in verse 4. You know, if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but threw them into hell and placed them in chains of darkness in order to be reserved for judgment, don't you think that he will use the same kind of judgment upon false teachers who are leading others astray? In verse 5, the ancient world. If God didn't spare the ancient world, but allowed it to be destroyed by a flood, although he saved Noah and, you know, the, his family, the other found righteous people. You know, don't you think he will bring false teachers to destruction? Verses 6 to 8 mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. And if God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction and reduced them to ashes, only delivering the righteous man Lot, don't you think that he will bring that same kind of destruction to the false teachers who have led others astray with their false teachings? 
And lastly, in verse 9, Peter answers those three questions as he comes to a summation about the statement. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Next, found in verse 12, they will utterly perish in their own corruption. To utterly perish means that to spoil entirely or to completely destroy. The word corruption also means to perish or destroy. So Peter could not use a stronger language than what he's written in 2 Peter. You know, he's talking about the reaping what they have been sowing. You know, they have been sowing destruction and they are going to reap it utterly. Five, they will receive the wages of unrighteousness, which is found in verse 13. Peter is emphasizing the same statement of destruction by using different vocabulary, but he means exactly the same thing. The wages of unrighteousness is eternal death, okay, which is found in Romans 3.23. Next, they will receive the gloom of darkness forever, found in verse 17. This gloom of darkness is reserved for them, so within the scriptures, darkness is equated to a life of sin. Paul instructs us to cast off the work of darkness, the works of darkness in Romans 13, 12. And he asks the question, what communion has light with darkness? And we know this from 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Even Jesus in his parable of the talents, he concluded by stating that the master cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, found in Matthew 25, 30. The implication is clear. The false teachers are facing gloom or mist of darkness, which is better reserved for them. Swift destruction, doom, judgment, utter perishing, death, and the gloom of darkness all await those who would be false teachers and lead others away from the truth. So that is the second truth. We will continue on with the final verses are found in 2 Peter chapter 2 and these are verses 20 to 22 and I, if you have your Bibles just open them up again and I will be reading from the New International Version and just follow me okay so verse 20 if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning verse 21 it would have been better for them to them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command and that was promised to them verse 22 of them the proverbs are true a dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud so this part of the Bible is about entangled again in the world. So after speaking about the impending doom of these false prophets, Peter now addresses those who are led astray by whom he describes as those with spots and blemishes. Yeah, they will utterly perish in their own corruption. As he shares some graphic warnings with the young Christians to whom he's writing, Peter warns not only against the false teachers, but also reminds us of the fact that we bear responsibility for ourselves. We are responsible and accountable for our own spiritual warfare. And if we allow ourselves to be led astray, we will pay the tremendous price for our sin. So Peter begins his warning by identifying those to whom he is directing his teaching. They are those who have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, verse 20, and they are the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error, that's verse 18. So Peter is affirming the truth taught repeatedly in the scriptures. The only way to escape sin and its accompanying pollutions of this world is through the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Here the word for knowledge is again ep epinosis. Peter uses the word three times in, this, in his first chapter. So he can go back and read that. 
Each time he uses it, he describes the privilege of knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord and to point out the value of knowing God as Savior, Jesus Christ. That's found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 8. I invite you to read those. As we have seen to walk in the Spirit, we who receive through faith in Christ is to walk in the opposite direction from the lusts of the flesh. This is the only way to escape the pollution of this world and the ultimate death and destruction to which it always leads. The statement in verse 20, if after they have escaped the pollutions of this world, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. This presents a difficult theological dilemma, which theologians have argued for centuries. There are those who, con who are content that once they have been born and knew of the Spirit, they can never be unborn. There, are also, there is also that point of view that which says, God has created us free moral agents. We can choose to leave the faith just as freely as we came to choose the faith. Peter does not address the issue directly. Instead, he exposes the deeper issue which both schools of theological thought have agreed upon. It is simple as this. A person who has come once to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and has escaped the pollutions of the world is in serious trouble when he or she becomes again entangled in the world and overcome by them. He declares they are worse off in their present condition than they ever were before coming to faith in Christ. That was found in verse 20. This is an extremely strong statement. It should stand as a strong refusion to those who think they can play games with God by dabbling in overt and premeditated sin while they claim to be living as Christians. Someone once counseled a man recently who openly admitted that he was living in adultery. He claimed he couldn't help it. He was just too weak to resist. He had convinced himself that God would ignore his overt sin because he was trying hard in every other area of his life. Peter would then say that this man was deceiving himself and that he was in serious trouble. His condition is worse than if he had never come into the light. He is living in clear violation of the commandments of God. He is lusting after the flesh rather than walking in the spirit, and he is in serious trouble. Verse 21 says, It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness. So this statement expands his teachings to make it so graphically clear none of us could fail to understand it. It would be better for a person never to have known the way of righteousness than after coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ to have turned his or her back on the holy commandment of the Lord himself. So these two statements are difficult to refute or to argue away. God does not offer us eternal life insurance policy, which allows us to accept Christ and then not follow him, nor to be born again of the spirit and then to lust after the flesh as our lifestyles, not to commit our lives to Christ and then live for the devil. That is not Christianity. It is pure hypocrisy. And Peter will not will not have any part of that kind of false teaching which deceives us. Peter has already warned against this fallacious teachings which promises freedom but actually leads to slaves of sin. And to illustrate his teaching, Peter shares two vivid examples from Proverbs 26, 11 to punctuate his contention. First, he states, those who have turned from the knowledge of Christ are illustrated by the Proverbs, a dog returns to his own vomit. Second, such a person is like a sow having washed, returned to her wallowing in the mire. 
So Peter's twofold warning is in is this chapter can be summarized in two brief statements. First, beware of false teachers who are on their way to eternal destruction. Second, if you follow them, you are responsible for your own actions and you will experience an end which is worse than if you never came to the knowledge of God. So, to summarize what we have learned these past two weeks, false teachers are religious in nature. These teachers are not atheists who deny God's existence or agnostics who are unsure if he exists. They may hold religious teaching positions, but they teach heresy or error. Teachings like Jesus is one way rather than the way, John 14, 6, or denying his divinity and lordship. Their teachings will be inconsistent with the foundational truths taught by the apostles. The presence of these false teachers is one reason believers are told to test the spirits, to see whether they are from God in 1 John 4, 1, and to show ourselves as approved, 2 Timothy 2, 15. The best way to identify the false is by knowing the truth in the person of Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. The best way to identify the false is by knowing the truth in the person of Jesus Christ. False teachers are motivated by greed, or Timothy 6.10 says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So it's no surprise that these false teachers are described by their greed. This isn't to say it's wrong to earn a living from religious teachings. However, false teachers are motivated more by making money than making disciples of Jesus. Merchandisers rather than ministers. They may use fear or flattering words for their own personal gain. They have gone the way of Balaam, who loved gain from wrongdoing. False teachers offer false freedom. In Christ, believers are indeed free, John 8, 36. This is not the freedom false teachers promise, described as waterless springs and mist driven by the storm, 2 Peter 2, 17. They're encouraged by their shameful ways. Those who repeatedly drink from this spring will never find satisfaction. Promises of freedom will produce bondage. 2 Peter 2.19 you know, I repeat again, false teachers are doomed for destruction. The apostle Peter paints a dark picture of these infiltrators. They are bold and willful. They have blots and blemishes. Their eyes are full of adultery their insatiable desire for sin. Their hearts are trained in greed. So, as we come to the end of our lesson on 2 Peter chapter 2, I want you to be reminded by my closing last week. But let us be mindful that though that there will be counterfeit, counterfeit teachers and false prophets, those who would want to profit from you again let us give way to the wisdom and discernment of god's truth in our lives let us ask god to help us that we will be protected by being led astray let us increase in our desire to study the word so that we will know it live it and share the truth to others okay like these are really strong words from Peter and I ask that we take heed and listen to these words. They are not my words, they are not Bishop's or Pastor Ashe's words, these are words from the scriptures and we know that time is getting short. We cannot be led away by these false teachers, how sad it will be. So let us pray. Um, as I close our session. Okay, so Heavenly Father, you are good, you are gracious, you are trustworthy, you are merciful, you are just, oh God. You're compassionate and you're patient. We thank you for your word that we have been able to study these past two weeks. We know the enemy seeks to steal, kill and destroy and he pounces at our weakest moments or when we least expect it. 
We ask that we will wear the full armour of God, that we will be ever ready and be strengthened by you. Continue to keep us all safe so that we are not led astray. Continue to give us wisdom, insight and understanding as we read and study your truths. That we will draw closer to you. Give us the courage to depend upon you and your word. Give us the humility to walk in your obedience as it is written in your word. Bless our steps as we follow in your direction and in your leading. We want to continue to commit our lives and our all our days unto you. We want to reflect your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, that brings me to the end of my teaching of Second Peter chapter 2. I just want to appreciate you for taking the time to listen. As short as it may be, I believe it has power. Yeah. So, I can honestly say that your time spent here listening to me um, right now, I know is time well spent. Amen. And we continue to pray that you will cherish and desire for more of God and his word. And you will fight that good fight of faith. Again, I just want to remind you of our cell celebrations this Sunday and our evangelistic nights on Friday and our Bible studies every Wednesday. Um, you can catch all these teachings on YouTube and Spotify playlist. So, yeah. Um, but lastly, I just want to come and ask for those of you who are hearing this for the first time and want to accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, I want you to um, say this prayer with me, okay? And just repeat after what I say. So, Heavenly Father, I come to you as I am. You see me transparent as I am. I ask that you forgive me for all my sins. Wash me clean with your most precious blood. I want to admit that I am nothing. I want to admit that I have failed you. But Lord, I know I just want to put my trust and hope in you alone. I declare that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through you, Jesus. I admit that I need you in my life. I need your spirit to guide me, lead me and direct me. I need you to fulfill and complete every area of my existence. I want to walk in your ways and I want to reflect your glory. Teach me and guide me. Show me the way to your truth. Let me not be led by the ways of this world, the deceits of the enemy. But I just want to surrender a life to you. I thank you and I honor you. In the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen and amen. So thank you for praying this prayer um, with me. I ask that you get in touch with the person who invited you to listen to this session um, and then get yourself into a Bible-believing church. Listen also to the directions of the Holy Spirit as he guides you. And then we pray that your life will increase in measure and that you will have a blessed life. So again thank you everyone for listening we hope to see you soon god bless you all take care